Hello and welcome to this special broadcast. Today in the show, we are going to discuss a globally acclaimed book. It's called Islam, Authoritarianism, Underdevelopment, a global and historical comparison. And I'm honored and privileged to have the author of the book on the show. Welcome, Professor Ahmed T. Guru. Uh, let me also tell you that uh, Professor is uh, also the director of Arabic and Islamic studies, uh, and he's also former uh, professor of political science at the University of San Diego. And also on the show, uh, I'm uh, very honored and privileged to have uh, another very uh, renowned and eminent personality, uh, Shah Faisal Sahab, who is uh, a civil servant in India, and he uh, he's, he's also been a Mason Fellow at Harvard University. He also takes keen interest in the subject we're going to discuss today. So let's open up the discussion without much ado. Uh, Shah Faisal Saab, I would request you to, uh, or rather I'd ask you, if you were to ask the first question on this world-renowned book, what would that be? Thank you, Atir, for, in, for inviting me to this and giving me this opportunity to speak to Professor Ahmed. Uh, honestly speaking, I've been looking forward to this discussion for quite some time now. And because this book has generated so much interest and so much debate across the world and in India also, it's very, very like uh, being liked a lot. So I have been like very keen on uh, asking Professor Ahmed some questions about the book so that the wider readership that we have here, maybe they would also get benefited. As you said rightly, that if there was one question which I would maybe begin with, it is that one important myth which is there in the South Asian Islam, we, which we have understood over the years, is that, you know, that there is this religion-state relationship and that in Islam, as we have understood it here, is that religion and state in Islam cannot be separated. But I think it is this question which Professor Ahmed has very clearly elucidated. And I would ask Professor Ahmed directly the first question that, I mean, you have debunked this kind of a myth that, no, this was not the case in the beginning years and decades of Islam. Could you please tell us more about it? Thank you, Mr. Shah, for really being part of the conversation. And I, I really appreciate the Awas channel with uh, the Mr. Han and other team members. This is really one million dollar question. And let me tell you this, that before this book, I had another book published in 2009 on secularism, comparing Turkey, France, and United States. At that time, Turkey had a French type assertive secularism, certain restrictions. And when I bring United States into table saying the Turkish policymakers that the French type laicite secularism is not the only way, but there is the American more religious friendly one, their general response to me is that you don't know Islam or Islam is really incompatible with the model you are suggesting. It works in the United States with a Christian background. So this debate really has very long historical roots in Turkey between the secularists and Islamists. And as a person who proposed a religious friendly secularism, I was criticized, someone sometimes attacked by both sides because secularists were telling me that a religious friendly secularism is not possible with Islam. Islam needs to be taken under control. And the Islamists were asking me, are you really a practicing Muslim, Ahmed? How, would you, how dare you proposing secular state? So that was my first book, 2009. Therefore, I realized that I need to dig into history and theology of Islam to respond both sides. And today, still, interestingly, worldwide, beyond Turkey, both Islamists and critiques of Islam agree on this issue that there is no separation of religion and state in Islam. The two polar camps have almost a consensus. But my data and analysis shows that First of all, in practice, there are 50 Muslim majority countries in the world today. 20 have secular constitutions. Other 20 countries have constitutions referring to Sharia, either a source of law or a principle of basis. And 10 countries in the Muslim world are in between, both secular 
and Islamic law reference constitutions. These show us that in practice, there is a huge ver diversity within the Muslim world with multiple secular and Islamically inspired constitutional regimes. Second thing is that in the text of Islamic sources like the Quran and the Hadith, there is nothing about mergence of religion and politics or what I call ulema state alliance or some of my South Asian friends called mullah state nexus. Therefore, scholars who defend the po political position fabricated hadith. There is a very famous saying that religion and state are twins. Religion is the foundation. State is the guardian. That without the foundation collapses, that without the uh, guard perishes. When I analyzed the origin of this so-called hadith, I find out that it is a Persian maxim said by Sasani King Ardashil 300 years before Prophet Muhammad salam. So therefore, since there is no textual basis, they fabricate it. Last but not least, let me conclude the historical data that from 8th to mid 11th century, out of about 4,000 Muslim scholars, ulema, 91% were privately funded. Only 9%, a minuscule minority, except to be paid by state patronage as qadi or judge and prosecutors in today's terminology. And major Sunni and Shi'i scholars such as Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, they refused to obey state authority. And they had both theological and historical reasons to see politics corrupt and they avoided it. So these are the really main parameters to show that Islam has multiple interpretations. And yes, there was a history of separation between religion and state in Islamic history. So we can elaborate in further questions if you want. Uh, Professor Ahmed, uh, when it, then essentially this departure take place and uh, could it be described as some sort of uh, counter reformation uh, given what happened to Christianity after arrival of Martin Luther? This is a very interesting question because, you know, as an academic living in the United States 22 years with Turkish origin and as a Muslim, I constantly, almost every day, compare Western societies with Muslim societies. And this comparison brought me some very interesting cases that historically, in fact, what Europeans achieve or experience as Renaissance and the Reformation, as you mentioned, already made by Muslims in their early history. Between 8th and 11th centuries, Muslims had a Renaissance, an Enlightenment, or whatever you name it, but basically an era of coexistence of Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, they together create a civilization of science and economic prosperity. And Muslims at the time were so open-minded that they allowed the contributions from other people with different religious backgrounds, some agnostics and others. And also they appreciate early civilizations of Greek philosophy, of Sasani government, of Indian mathematics. And they brought together and make a synthesis and taught basic things to Europe. Muslims taught agricultural productions, paper making techniques and mathematics and other things to Europeans, but they learn from different neighbors and earlier civilizations. So therefore, what Europe achieved and started to experience after the 12th, 13, 14 centuries, Muslim already did it in their early history. But somehow after the 11th century, there became a reversal. Muslims became unfortunately more and more narrow-minded and close-minded on certain issues. What I call ulema state alliance emerge. 
bourgeoisie, the economic entrepreneurs were marginalized. Intellectuals were marginalized, both religious and secular thinkers, independent of state authority, were marginalized. Whereas Europe, which was dominated by Catholic clergy and military aristocracy until the 11th century, started to experience the rise of economic entrepreneurs and intellectuals gradually in the 12th, 13th, 14th century. And then what we see the result today is that more developed Europe and less developed Middle East and elsewhere in the Muslim world. So therefore, the West and the Muslim world learn from each other, they compete, and there is a reversal of destiny starting in the 11th century. Interesting. So that's a very crucial point which you made in the book as well, that you know this forging of the Ulema State Alliance around the 11th century. And I come to the role of uh, Imam al-Ghazali, and I must tell you that Imam al-Ghazali is held in the highest esteem at least in South Asia, and I mean, any kind of criticism against Imam is considered to be a blasphemous. But I mean, you have had, I think, a counterpoint about that in your book. So would you tell us about the role of Ghazali in facilitating this Ulama State Alliance and in facilitating maybe this departure? A very complex uh, phenomenon we have here because uh, in my book, there are certain important figures I cited hundreds of times. One is Ghazali and about 15 different books uh, or a dozen of them cited in my book. Another is Ibn Khaldun, uh, the author of Muqaddima, famous Muslim historian. And why I took Ghazali very seriously. First of all, he is very influential everywhere from Turkey for, to Indonesia and other countries. Second, he is very complex and he had many changes in his life. So therefore we have to focus which Ghazali we are talking about. The early Ghazali when he was a young scholar was part of Ulema State Alliance. He appreciated Ulema State Alliance and he attacked the enemies, quote-unquote, of the Ulema State Alliance, such as philosophers, certain Shias, and others, wrote very effective books like Tahafatul Philosophy, the inconsistence of incoherence of philosophers. And he declared major figures like Ibn Sina Farabi as infidel and their followers as apostate punishable by that. This is really negative legacy of Ghazali. But the same person, this very complex Muslim scholar, regret that he had such close relations with the state and he had a change in midlife. Then after the age of 40, he went to the Prophet Abraham's mausoleum and took an oath that he will never receive money from public authorities again. He will never teach publicly run madrasas again, and he will never even join the debate gatherings of political authorities again. And he had about a decade of isolation, his private teachings, putting himself in a humble Sufi, Sufi way, avoiding politics. So this showed that even the major figure of Ulema State Alliance, an architect, regret what he did, changed the course. And today, when we read Ghazali, we should be critical to see the inconsistencies and change. Yes, the Muslim youth today may be inspired by some ideas, but at the same time, certain ideas need to be updated and sometimes rejected. For example, the declaration of Ibn Sina and Farabi as infidels, even Ottoman scholars reject and saying that Ghazali was wrong. Ibn Sina was a Muslim and declaring him as infidel was a wrong idea. Even the Ottoman scholars wrote a book to reject Ghazali's idea. But at the same time, he had really open-minded views. For example, he said that Byzantium Christians, since they don't know what the true character of Prophet Muhammad is, they may have salvation. Even if they reject the Prophet, they don't know who the truly Prophet was. So this is an interesting idea, for example, if you mention today, they could declare you an apostate, but Ghazali wrote it in his book. So we have such a complex figure. 
Yes, uh, Professor Ahmed, this brings us to the question, can Islamic countries see democracy? Or is it that democracy, uh, or is it that Islam is incompatible with democracy, as is being argued? Thank you. This is a very important question. First of all, it needs really definition of the two concepts, democracy and Islam. If we understand democracy as the rule of majority, this is not enough because majority may decide to violate rights of minority. A true democracy is not only free and uh, frequent and fair elections, but at the same time, the protection of certain level of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, especially rights of minorities. And at this regard, we really need to challenge or uh, revise certain fuqh principles, fuqh Islamic law, for example, yeah. if it includes blasphemy and apostasy laws restricting religious freedom and freedom of speech, if they put minorities as secondary citizens, how can we have a democracy with giving everybody the full equal rights of citizenship? Therefore, some people say we need a completely secular system by putting religion aside, having a true democracy. Or others says that we need to reform Islam. This is a big debate. My position is that even if people have very traditional views about their practicing religion, that's their private affair. But when it comes to public, if we agree on democracy, we really need to accept that there will be freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and the protection of the rights of minorities. That kind of Islam, accepting this, perfectly compatible with democracy. But there are some who produces ideas of restrictions, oppressions, and radicalism. Of course, their Islam is not compatible with democracy. That brings me to a related question, which is that uh, when you talk about restrictions, when you talk about acceptability to new ideas, I would want, I'm very curious to know, like, how has the ulama community received your book? And uh, I mean, do they categorize you as al Medin because you don't, you're not possibly necessarily studied in a madrasa, but how has been this like discussion with them? How has the conversation gone so far? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, so far, the book has been translated into Indonesian, Arabic, Persian, Bosnian, and partially Malay. And Alhamdulillah, there is uh, a dozen contracts I sign from Somalia to France to Netherlands. So uh, another 12 translations are coming in one, two years. And it's very diverse people voluntarily contributing to translate, to disseminate the book. It's really like uh, many people help me to really discuss these issues. I'm thankful to all of them. Some of them are very uh, practicing conservative Muslims. And then they think that these ideas should be discussed. Some, some alims are among them or some intellectuals or uh, civil activists. There are also non-Muslims in Europe as at the translating because they think these ideas contribute in uh, intra-civilizational, inter-faith dialogue and mutual understanding with some Muslims and others. And in terms of scholars, generally independent scholars who are not directly paid by the state, who have their own challenges, who know what ulema state alliance are, they are more positively contributing. And those who are benefiting from the system, of course, it's normal for them to be more critical. And another thing, interestingly, beyond the ulama, the Western intellectuals and academia, some of them treat it as a potentially Islamophobic book and telling me that Ahmed, uh, don't publish it for in English. Maybe you can publish in Arabic, etc. Because in, in the US, you may spread Islamophobia. And I say, as a Muslim, I write a book, yes, some critical approaches. What, what? Instead, I think this is the real solution to Islamophobia. If Muslims come up with new ideas, critical ideas, address the problems seriously and honestly, I think that's a good way to really destroy some prejudices that we are all brainwashed, dogmatic, etc. No, we are not dogmatic. 
we take issues, we look at the data, and we are ready to talk and discuss. Well, uh, Professor uh, Ahmed, then uh, we'd like to ask you, what could be the way forward for the Muslim communities to negotiate the challenges which are thrown up by the modernity? This is something really we need to think about the long-term solutions. And religion, theology, of course, these are important things, but that's not the only thing because we live in a world with material factors, economic factors, politics, geopolitics. And in social science, we have all constantly thinking whether ideas or material factors. And in my book and generally in my mind, both are important. So on the one hand, Muslims really need to devise their ideas, update and think the conditions to understand religion better. But there are also material factors. And from history to present, ulema state alliance and authoritarian forces use economic resources. One resource initially they use was land money. And in the Iqta system, Arabic or Tamar in the Ottoman Turkish, they use land revenue distribution, making land monies as resources for military commanders and civilians and the ulama. Today, the real source mostly coming from oil and natural gas. Saudi Arabia and Iran as two major Islamist countries use oil money to spread their messages all around the world. Wahhabism or Salafism in general were funded by oil money. So is the Iranian understanding of political Islam. Now oil money is depleting. Eventually it will be gone, either by new discoveries of alternative energy resources or by the basic fact that oil is, a, is not infinite, it will be depleted soon. And by the decline of oil money, we'll see less funding for Iranian or Saudi propaganda or the ulama state alliance in general. And therefore, that makes me optimistic about the future. There will be multiple uh, economic resources and the governments and authoritarian religious ulama state alliance will be weakened, hopefully. So therefore, both of them, both there is a debate about ideas we need to keep doing and the other thing keep watch economic resources how they will change and what will its political impact in the future very well uh, really interesting uh, so this brings us to the end of discussion it's been really a very uh, a truly intellectually stimulating discussion and we at our the voice uh, professor Hamid, we always encourage uh, intellectual dialogue and we believe in inclusive India. And or, as you know, Indians believe that world is one family. Uh, uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, uh, uh, Professor Ahmed and Shah Faisal Thank you very much. Thank you.